Hello, listeners. This is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. This week's lesson is titled God's Call to Mission and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, October 21. It's from the series God's Mission, Our Mission. The lessons have been authored by the directors of six global mission centres around the world under the leadership of Dr. Gary Krause of Adventist Mission. Your reader is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 14. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, We thank you once again for your word. Lord, it is so great that we still have access to what was written so long ago that you gave through the prophets and you gave through the disciples and you gave through the apostles that each of us could understand what your will was for your people in the past and what it is for us now. And we thank you that it tells us the story of your great love and of your sending your son Jesus, that each of us could have access to you and have eternal life. And Lord, we just pray that as we open your word this week and look at this lesson on how we can share your love and your grace and your story with those around us, that your Holy Spirit will guide and bless us. And that as we come to the end of the week, that not only will we understand more, but that we will walk closer with you and more graciously accept your grace, which is so freely offered to us. And today I'd like to pray for Pushrag Rajnath and for Brenda Goodridge and for Uriel James, and then for Javed McQuain from the Solomon Islands and Lystra Brake and her family and Leonie and her children and family in Jamaica and Emma in Lubbock, Texas, and Joseph Stoffel, and all those who are listening through the services of Christian Services for the Blind, and those listening through the services of Christian Record Services in the North American Division. Lord, wherever we're living, on all of the great continents of the earth, and listening to your word, we pray that each of us and our families and our local churches may be blessed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's read that again. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. God can sometimes move us out of our comfort zone and make us his witnesses. Sometimes this change can be used to accomplish his purposes, such as in the example of the dispersing of the people at the Tower of Babel. This dispersion, Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 120, was the means of peopling the earth, and thus the Lord's purpose was accomplished through the very means that men had employed to prevent its fulfilment. End of quote. Abraham, meanwhile, went from his home country to another, we read that in Genesis chapter 12, as a means of witness. The disciples of Jesus went from working among their own people in Acts chapter 3 to working for others as well, as we read in Acts chapter 8 verses 1 to 4. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, our memory verse for today, Jesus laid down a principle of evangelism. They would start locally, Jerusalem and Judea, then go to Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. But even if we do not leave our country, God still wants us to reach out to the people around us. 
When the church in Jerusalem was becoming complacent, its members were dispersed. Though persecution came and people suffered, these unfortunate events became a means of transforming the good news all over the world. Sunday, October 15. Moving beyond our comfort zone. In order to reach others, God intends for us to move beyond our comfort zone. The desire to remain only with our own ilk and ethnic or social kind can lead to selfishness, even evil. This danger is one of the lessons derived from the story of Babel. Read Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. What were the intentions of the people? What were they wanting to do? And why would God thwart it? Genesis 11, beginning at verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there, over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This story of the people at the Tower of Babel reveals their great ambition. They were planning to make a monumental structure, a city and a tower such as existed nowhere else in the world, a tower, as it says in verse 4, that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. How often today do people seek to do the same, whether through politics, art, business, even religion, it doesn't matter. There are those who want to make a great name for themselves. In the end, how futile and meaningless their endeavours are, as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine, while guiding my heart with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made my works great, I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards, I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labour. And this was my reward from all my labour. Then I looked on all the works that my hand had done, and on the labour in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. 
There was no prophet under the sun. The Bible says in Genesis 11.4 that these people wanted to build the tower so that they would avoid being scattered over the face of the earth. They wanted to stick together for their own selfish reasons. But God had another plan. These people were also united for this work. But the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Genesis 11 verse 6 This ambitious plan of the people was in fact evil. Though Scripture does not say it explicitly, Ellen White says that they didn't trust God's promise that he would never destroy the earth with water again, as we read in Genesis chapter 9 and verses 14 and 15. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. They intended to build for their own perceived safety rather than to trust God's word. Whatever their ultimate motives, God knew that their intentions were not pure, but were filled with selfish ambition, and so he prevented them from achieving their stated goals. And so to finish today, are you part of a group or ethnic community that is more comfortable among themselves? In what ways may you possibly engage with others who are not part of your race, ethnicity or nationality? Monday, October 16, Becoming a Blessing to the Whole World. Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. In what way was God's instruction to Abram a call to mission? Let's read that Genesis chapter 12 and beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." God asked Abram, whose name he later changed to Abraham, to leave his country and his people and go to another land. It was all part of God's plan to use Abraham as a vehicle to fulfill his divine purposes in the earth. And Abraham went, according to the word of the Lord. If God has a plan for you, it may be a call for you to leave your extended family and your people and go to a place that he is opening up for you to serve him in order that you can be a blessing to others. Read the following texts. What does each text tell of God's covenant, his promise to us? First of all, Genesis 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And Genesis 17, verse 19, Then God said, No, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And Numbers 24 verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of the tumult. And Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And Matthew 1 verse 21. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. From the above texts, it is clear that God was going to accomplish the promise made in the Garden of Eden that someone will come as a solution to the sin problem. The solution, Jesus Christ the Messiah, was to arise from the line of Abraham and Isaac through Sarah. Hebrews 11.9 states that Isaac and Jacob were heirs to the promise of blessing that God made to Abraham. As we read in Hebrews 11 verse 9, By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. We don't know exactly how much Abraham himself knew or understood of just how the promised seed would arise through him, but he moved out in faith anyway. By faith, we read in Hebrews 11 verse 8, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. What an example for us. So to finish the day, suppose you are called by God to go, not knowing where you are going. How do you respond and why? Tuesday, October 17, Abraham's Call Following the call of God, Abraham entered the land as God had commanded him. However, right from the start, things didn't seem to go too well for him. He arrived where God told him to go, but according to the Bible in Genesis 12 verse 6, the Canaanites were there in the land, pagans known for their cruelty and violence. No wonder that right after Abraham got there, the Lord appeared to him and said, To your descendants I will give this land, in verse 7. No doubt Abraham needed the encouragement. However, things still didn't go particularly well for him, at least at first. Read Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, through to chapter 13, verse 1. What things happened to him next, and what mistakes did this man of God make? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he went to Sarai his wife. Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me. But they will let you live. Please say you are my sister." so it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was, when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? 
Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Then in chapter 13, verse 1, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. How discouraging it must have been for him, leaving a comfortable and most likely prosperous existence in the homeland, only to go not knowing where he was going, as it said in verse 8 of Hebrews 11. And one of the first things he faced was a famine. This famine was so bad that he had to leave the place he had been told by God to settle in and go somewhere else. And then things got even worse after that. As you read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 130, during his stay in Egypt, Abraham gave evidence that he was not free from human weakness and imperfection. In concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, he betrayed a distrust of the divine care, a lack of that lofty faith and courage so often and nobly exemplified in his life. Through Abraham's lack of faith, Sarah was placed in great peril. The king of Egypt, being informed of her beauty, caused her to be taken to his palace, intending to make her his wife. But the Lord, in his great mercy, protected Sarah by sending judgments upon the royal household. End of quote. No one has ever said mission work was easy, and by lying, by being deceitful, Abraham only made matters worse. Fortunately, God is a God of patience, and he didn't cast off his servant for his mistake, which, unfortunately, would not be the only one Abraham would make. How comforting to know that even despite our errors, if we cling to the Lord in faith and submission, as did Abraham, not only can our errors, sins and faults be forgiven, but the Lord can still use us for mission. And to finish today, what lessons can we take from the story about Abram in Egypt? Wednesday, October 18, The Early Church and Comfort Zones Read Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. In the early church, what brought about the scattering of believers beyond their comfort zone? Acts 8, beginning at verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Until this time, the early church was mainly in Jerusalem, or within the Jewish territory and among the Jewish people. When persecution began, in which Saul, a devout Jew and a Pharisee, was actively involved, the church in Jerusalem was then dispersed all over Judea and Samaria. Jesus had predicted in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. This statement was fulfilled as noted in Acts chapter 8 verse 4 that those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Even after the church began to move out beyond Jerusalem, the believers were still preaching in the regions of the Jews or in the neighbourhoods of the Jewish people in other cities. Acts chapter 11 verse 19 indicates that the believers were dispersed all the way to Phoenicia or Lebanon and Cyprus, but they did not at this stage preach the message to anyone other than the Jews alone. Let's look at that text in Acts 11.19. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only.
The disciples of Jesus and the early church did not intend to see the Gentiles, but only Jews come to the Lord. They still had very narrow views on what the mission of the church was to be. Peter, a disciple of Jesus and one of the leading figures of the early church, was averse to taking the gospel message to the Gentiles, even after Paul had begun to do so. Peter was known as an apostle to the circumcised, meaning the Jews, and Paul an apostle to the Gentiles. Let's read Galatians chapter 2 and verse 8. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. Early on, Peter did not even want to be seen with the Gentiles, as we read in Galatians 2, verses 11 and 12. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision." However, God moved Peter out of his comfort zone and changed his heart. He was starting to learn about what the Gospel Commission really entailed and what Jesus' death was meant to accomplish for the whole world. And then let's read Acts chapter 10 verses 9 to 15 and 28 to 29 and answer this question. What was the message that the Lord was giving to Peter? And how must we in our day and age apply this principle to the work of mission? Let's read those texts. Acts 10 verses 9 to 15. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And verses 28 and 29. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I ask then, for what reason have you sent me? Thursday, October 19, starting from where you are. Read Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What principle did Jesus present when doing the work of sharing or being his witnesses to the world? Acts 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the principle set out by Jesus that shows us how we need to act as his disciples who have the good news to share with others. Sharing the truth is not about convincing others how wrong they are, but about sharing Jesus as portrayed in the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And just to remind ourselves, let's begin at verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. 
And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There are, however, some principles in the words of Jesus in Acts 1, verse 8. First, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. As we have seen, but it is worth repeating, we are to be his witnesses in the place where we physically reside. This may include our own home, our church, our neighbourhood and our community. We need to be his witnesses first where we are, in the area he has initially placed us, home or work, and to be his witnesses to the people closest to us. It can be close family or extended family, church people, work colleagues, neighbours and the community. Sometimes people are interested only in going off to a far country and alien culture to be God's witnesses, but they do not witness to people around them now. We should begin where we are and move from there as the Lord leads us. Next, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, Acts 1 verse 8. Again, Jesus affirms the reality that witnessing involves crossing cultural boundaries. Beginning from where we are, we may be called to move to other areas to reach out to different social, ethnic and religious groups. If I belong to a certain ethnic or language people group, it may be much easier for me to witness to them because of minimal cultural barriers to cross. In some areas of the world, only one clan or tribe is represented in the makeup of the church. However, Jesus' great commission tells us that as his witnesses, moving out of our comfort zone and investing our resources for such people groups is crucial. They also need the message of Jesus. And here's challenge. Identify and make a list of people groups with special needs in your community whom the church has not made efforts to reach. And challenge up. Begin praying for an opportunity in the near future to become engaged in mission to people with special needs. Friday, October 20. Further thought. If you have the opportunity, read Ellen White's The Great Commission, pages 25 to 34, and A Seeker for Truth on pages 131 to 142 in the Acts of the Apostles. Let's read these quotes. The first is from the Acts of the Apostles, page 27 and 28. Before ascending to heaven, Christ gave his disciples their commission. He told them that they were to be the executors of the will in which he bequeathed to the world the treasures of eternal life. You have been witnesses of my life of sacrifice in behalf of the world, he said to them. You have seen my labours for Israel. And although my people would not come to me that they might have life, although priests and rulers have done unto me as they listed, although they have rejected me, they shall have still another opportunity of accepting the Son of God. You have seen that all who come to me confessing their sins I freely receive. Him that cometh to to me I will in no wise cast out to you, my disciples, I commit this message of mercy. It is to be given to both Jews and Gentiles, to Israel first, and then to all nations, tongues and peoples. All who believe are to be gathered into one church. End of quote. The Great Commission is clear. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations 
in Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, it is definitely about going to others, especially other nations. In the Acts of the Apostles, page 28, we read, The Gospel Commission is the great missionary charter of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving to all the invitation of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them. They were to go to the people with their message. End of quote. And then, from another quote, and this is from page 140 to 142. There are in our world many who are nearer the kingdom of God than we suppose. In this dark world of sin, the Lord has many precious jewels to whom he will guide his messengers. Everywhere there are those who will take their stand for Christ. Many will prize the wisdom of God above any earthly advantage and will become faithful light bearers. Convinced that Peter's course was in direct fulfilment of the plan of God and that their prejudices and exclusiveness were utterly contrary to the spirit of the gospel, they glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Thus, without controversy, prejudice was broken down, and exclusiveness established by the custom of ages was abandoned, and the way was opened for the gospel to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. How would you define the word mission as you apply it to your own life? 2. In what ways could you daily express mission in your attitude and behaviour? How can you be more mission-minded in your daily tasks? And 3. How important is it that we examine our hearts and seek power from above to be purged from prejudice against those unlike us? Desperate for a Mission Story by Andrew McChesney Gina Wallen was excited to visit a house church in a country where Christians face persecution for their faithfulness to God. She had arrived to collect mission stories for Adventist Mission. The house church turned out to be a former home on the ground floor of an apartment building. The apartment had been gutted and turned into a church, with a main sanctuary on one side and a small room on the other. Gina began interviewing people in the small side room with an interpreter. The people were earnest and kind, but they didn't seem to have any special stories, speaking instead about the technical aspects of a house church. As time passed, Gina grew desperate. This was the only place where she had planned to collect stories in the country. Dear Lord, please help me to find someone who has an inspiring story, she prayed. I don't know how to find anyone because I don't speak the language and I don't think that the interpreter can help. So, Lord, would you please send someone? Soon afterward, a woman stepped into the room. Gina felt impressed to speak with her and struck up a conversation through the interpreter. Have you been coming to this church for long? Gina asked. No, the woman hadn't. She'd been coming for only a few months. Gina asked how she had learned about Seventh-day Adventists. The woman said she had been walking with her children to the market on a Saturday. As they walked along the sidewalk, two neatly dressed men approached her. The seventh day is the Sabbath, said one. To learn more, look on the internet, said the other. Then the men kept walking. The woman went home and searched online. Somehow, she found a series of Adventist presentations by a U.S. evangelist that had been dubbed into her language. She watched many programs and was greatly blessed. Then, she somehow found the house church. She showed up, prepared for baptism, and was baptized shortly before Gina's arrival. I was amazed when I heard her story and was so delighted that God answered my prayer in such a beautiful way, Gina said. Gina Wallen served as Mission Quarterly's editor at Adventist Mission for three years. Currently, she works as an editor and project manager for the Office of the Central Conference President. The house church featured in this mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach in large cities across the 10 to 40 window among the unreached and unread-reached people 
groups and to non-Christian religions. You can read more on IWillGo2020.org. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful. Thank you.